Hey Raptors, Mr. Lasseter here with you, and in this series of videos, we're going to be playing a little catch-up as we spend time on our document-based questions in class. Uh, you have read quite a bit, and I haven't had time really to go over the major uh, or key points um, that you've been seeing in our uh, section on uh, Tang and Song China. Uh, and some of Southeast Asia and East Asia. So let's go ahead and take a look at the Tang Empire, which lasts from around 618 to 907 CE. Uh, so let's talk about the early Tang Empire. It was established in 618, as we said. Um, and it carried out a program of territorial expansion. Uh, we see that it avoided over-centralization, uh, so some provinces gaining a little bit more independence. Um, but this Tang dynasty really has a lot of Turkic influences. In fact, um, a lot of kind of Turkic peoples holding high positions here. Um, and so it would combine this influence with Chinese Confucius, uh, Confucian traditions um, to generate uh, quite a large empire. You see that the traditional um, kind of core of this Chinese civilization is still present, but uh, it kind of has this arm uh, that reaches out here to uh, the Turkic regions of uh, Central Asia. So you see that connection simply in the shape of the empire. But you also see some rival groups uh, on either side. Uh, the government allowed local nobles, gentry, officials, and religious establishments to exercise significant power. Um, again, avoiding over-centralization, uh, relying more on local control. Uh, this Tang Empire became a formidable army. It combined uh, Chinese things like the crossbow and infantry with the Turkish horsemanship, uh, the use of the stirrup. Uh, and so this allowed uh, the Tang Empire actually to fight off uh, Arab Muslim armies to the west. Tang emperors uh, legitimized their control. That is, um, they, they justified their control by using... Uh, the Buddhist idea that kings are spiritual agents. Um, and so early on in the Tang Empire, we see kind of uh, a use of Buddhism to, uh, to cement power. Buddhist monasteries were important allies of early Tang emperors even. Uh, so they received tax exemption, land, and gifts uh, in response for, for loyalty or assistance. And Mahayana Buddhism was the main type of Buddhism that we see here, as we've talked about before. It was very attractive to the locals, it had very flexible belief systems, uh, as opposed to Theravada Buddhism or uh, the narrow path. Mahayana was more of a wide path where they could adapt uh, local deities. Uh, we see in China the uh, belief in bodhisattvas, uh, which were kind of equivalent to saints. They were extremely holy um, Buddhist thinkers who could uh, basically stay behind and help other people reach enlightenment. Translation of Buddhist texts into Chinese uh, was also widespread, and Mahayana Buddhism naturally spread along trade routes within China. And as you see here, this Buddhist temple on the left, there are several other examples of Buddhist temples built during the early Tang Dynasty. Speaking of trade, uh, trade routes across Central and East Asia converged really at the Tang capital of Chang'an. Uh, these trade routes brought people and cultural influences from all over, and so Chang'an truly was a cosmopolitan city. Uh, it was the destination of ambassadors from other states uh, sent under this tribute system. Uh, basically, independent countries or independent regions would acknowledge the Chinese emperor's supremacy and so they would send in their ambassadors. This is actually uh, a statue of a foreign trader uh, in the city uh, of Chang'an. Uh, the city of Chang'an itself had over a million residents. Most of them resided outside of the city walls. Uh, but, and foreigners lived in kind of special compounds, urban residents uh, in walled, gated, or residential quarters. Uh, and roads and canals, including the Grand Canal, uh, brought people and goods to the city. But uh, the Tang Dynasty uh, did not was not without rivals, as I mentioned earlier. In the mid-8th century, a Turkic group known as the Uyghurs uh, built an empire in Central Asia. And you can see them if you follow my mouse. Uh, they were known 
uh, as merchants and scribes. They had strong ties to Islam in the West. They had ties to China. They had even developed their own writing. Um, and the Uyghur Empire lasts somewhere between 50 to 100 years, probably 50 years of, of real sh- of strength, but it's probably around closer to 100 years than what it says here. Um, Tibet, on the other side of this narrow uh, isthmus of control that the Tang had, uh, was a large empire with access to Southeast Asia, China, South and Central Asia. Um, Therefore, it was open to a lot of different cultures, Indian, Chinese, Islamic, and even Greek culture. If you remember back to that Hellenistic culture that spread throughout Persia and much of the Mediterranean. Uh, The Tibetans excelled at war and uh, allied with the Tang eventually um, after uh, intermarriage of these two empires. Later on, though, in the Tang Dynasty, we start to see trouble. Usually, uh, an empire can only stay around for so long. There are economic issues. There are cultural issues. uh, And there's decentralization as different warlords want more and more power. And the Tang elites uh, were kind of looking why this might be the case. And they found this, uh, or they developed the answer, uh, basically by looking at Buddhism as evil. They began to see this as undermining the Confucian ideals of China. Uh, And they were very displeased with Buddhist ideas that challenged uh, Confucian beliefs. For example, the worth of women. Buddhist ideals uh, uh, held women to higher esteem than in Confucian society, and so that obviously was a conflict. Uh, The government and officials started to blame common evils on the barbaric behavior and barbaric behavior on Buddhism. And they saw it as a threat to the throne, uh, especially the idea that Buddhist temples and monks did not pay taxes, they did not serve in the army, they did not produce food for the well-being of everyone in the dynasty or in the empire. And so the Tang Empire, which originally develops with this connection to Buddhism, eventually tries to eradicate this threat. Um, They thought it would restore ancient values and peace to their society. And so we start to see this purge, this this oppression uh, or repression of Buddhism in China. Some local warlords would protect Buddhist temples. Uh, Many are destroyed uh, and uh, many of them are, some of them are saved. Buddhism never really recovers from this repression in China. It does not uh, really come back quite as strong as it was before this repression. Uh, And I think you've seen that a little bit in the DBQ that you're working on, uh, which looked, for example, one document, uh, the Edict on on Buddhism. Oh, and that Edict of Buddhism, this is the picture here, is of the emperor who wrote that emperor. uh, The Tang Empire eventually, though, meets its end uh, around 907. It goes through a sharp pretty quick decline over a period of about 30 years. Um, They faced internal rebellions. They faced external uh, pressure. Uh, And ultimately, the military governors who were trying to maintain peace in all these areas uh, end up losing control. In 907, the Tang State basically ends, and new, smaller kingdoms are established. The same type of fragmentation that we see in this dynastic cycle of China throughout its history. And the dynasty that will rise up and eventually unite this region again uh, in the year 960 will be the Song Dynasty. All right, that's it, guys. I'll be back in the next video to talk to you about this Song Dynasty.